G'day, Chris here and welcome back to ClickSpring. There are several circular features within the mechanism that at first glance could be reasonably assumed to have been formed on a lathe. And the front dial plate is a perfect example, with a large central hole and a recess that accepts the calendar ring. And then of course there's the calendar ring itself, designed to be a close running fit within that recess. Even with the extensive corrosion of the wreckage, it's clear that these parts once fit together very well, and that their surfaces were cleanly and accurately cut. There are similar features on the interior of both B1 and E4 that again suggest a trepanned lathe cut, or perhaps a chisel cut cleaned up with files. But the spiral grooves on the rear dial of the mechanism suggest another possibility. The slot is approximately one millimetre wide, and what initially appears to be a true spiral is in fact a collection of half circles. In the orientation shown on screen, the upper half of curves on the Saros spiral are centred on this hole, but the lower curves are constructed from a point just a little to the side, and something similar applies to the metonic spiral. The top curves are constructed off centre, and the lower curves are constructed from the hole at the centre of the spiral. The individual arcs are not obviously suited to formation on a lathe, and would have been extremely tedious to form with files or a saw. But they are well suited to some sort of geometric construction, with arcs of known radii struck from centres a known distance apart. If that construction tool was something robust, like a trammel, then the addition of a cutting edge would make it a very powerful tool indeed. And as it happens, there was just such a cutting edge widely used throughout the period, although its primary use is presently understood to have been for freehand engraving, and the tool I'm referring to is the chisel-shaped blade, known as a scorper. There are several bronze artefacts from the period that show the basic markings of this sort of cutter when used as an engraving tool. When rocked from side to side, it makes a fast ornamental pattern, commonly referred to as a wriggle cut. But if the tool is held upright to the work, it becomes capable of taking off large curls of metal with each stroke, something that would have been of great interest and value to an ancient worker. Now I've covered the creation of a cheap workshop steel suitable for making cutting tools like files and drill bits in previous episodes, so be sure to check out those videos. But essentially it's a very easily executed carburisation process that could have been used to transform wrought iron into a hardenable carbon steel in the workshop environment. Much like modern carbon steel, it can be shaped with files in the annealed state and then simply quench hardened before tempering and sharpening. In this case, I started with some carburised round stock left over from making drill bits, but any small scrap of wrought iron could have been carburised and then forged into a suitable shape to form the scorper blank. I've used a relatively large coarse file to generate the rough tool shape to show that file size and quality need not have been a limitation on the generation of small carbon steel cutting tools. The scorper blank is currently a little over a millimetre thick and about two and a half millimetres deep and could have been taken much smaller with the same file if required. Once formed, it's an easy process to harden the steel by taking it to a red heat and then quenching in water. A file skates over the surface of the metal, confirming that the steel is in a glass-hard, martensitic state. A quick polish with pumice is enough to abrade the surface to reveal the temper colour. And once tempered, it's ready to be sharpened and taken through to its final dimension. With olive oil proving to be a good fuel for the lamp, as well as a suitable lubricant for the abrasive stones.
Okay, so that's the cutting tool sorted, now for the trammels. And much like the previous tool proposals, I've chosen to keep the design elements as simple as possible, with the features limited to only those that we know for certain could have been formed with the tool technology of the day. The main goal is to build a minimum viable tool that explains a given feature in the mechanism but without introducing additional complexity that itself would require validation. If at the end of the process a functioning mechanism can be constructed from the simplest possible tools, then that at least provides a plausible baseline from which to speculate about the full extent of the tool tech of the day. The trammels require a robust pivot to perform accurately, and I chose to use a small disc in which to drill the pivot holes. For the sake of this video, I'm going to call these discs pivot buttons, but they need not be disc shaped like this. Any scrap of metal of suitable size and flatness would have done the job. Sleeves and alignment pins are required to locate the pivot buttons on the dial plate as well as a removable pivot for the trammel. Again, I've chosen a shape for this pivot that I find convenient, but it need not have looked like this at all, and could have been as simple as a pin tapped into position with a hammer. The pivot can be easily repositioned within the trammel, and the depth of cut of the scorper can be adjusted by simply tapping it progressively deeper with a hammer as the cut proceeds. Now, of course, the spirals each have a slightly different geometry, so I decided on the least complex solution of a separate trammel for each. But it's not difficult to imagine a slightly more evolved version of the tool, closer to the modern universal trammel that could plausibly have been constructed in the period. Regardless, it's a very straightforward and cheap set of tools to make. The big question is, how well does it perform? So let's give it a run and at the same time test out one of the marking methods from the previous Fragments video. In this case, India ink. To begin with, the scorper is set slightly high in the trammel, clear of the work surface, and so must be tapped lower to just bring it into contact with the work. The first few cuts on the spiral are critical to the outcome of the job essentially guiding the rest of the process, so it's worthwhile to be able to view the behaviour of the tool before committing to the cut. Running the tool backwards very lightly over the work removes the India ink coating, but doesn't substantially cut the metal, permitting a constant check of the geometry as it's laid out on the work, and importantly, giving a last opportunity to catch any major errors. As mentioned previously, the arcs are centred on different points of the rear dial plate, and to ensure that they meet up to form the complete spiral, the scorper location must also change to the adjacent position on the trammel. As the layout of the spirals begins to take shape, 
the maker's choice to simplify the curves from a true spiral to half circles starts to take on a particular significance and serves as one of the best visual examples of the principles underpinning the mechanism's design. Of very complex ideas framed and presented using the simplest geometric elements that in turn correspond to the basic drafting tools, the straight edge and divider. OK, so with the layout complete and the tool geometry confirmed, the cutting can begin. And it becomes immediately apparent that this is a very effective cutting tool. Three or four passes establishes the cut, and once established, it's essentially self-guiding to the bottom. I found a small increase in performance by using olive oil as a cutting fluid, and I think its main contribution was to lubricate the sides of the groove as the slot deepened. With care, the cut radius can be kept inside a tenth of a millimetre tolerance on the arc. And importantly, the tool doesn't require any particular skill to operate. Certainly nothing like that required to control a file or a saw along such a precise path. And perhaps the sweetest cider metal worker from any era could wish to see when testing a tool would be this. A collection of bright, tightly curled chips showing a uniform depth of cut and even a natural tendency to chip break as the slot depth increases. The information carried in those chips is exactly the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. The tool is cutting well, so keep going. The spirals are presently quite fragile, and of course they'll be braced and the dial engraved in a future episode. But before I close off this video, I'd like to cover some of the possible roles a tool like this could have filled in the ancient world. The pivot button concept means that it could have been used to very quickly cut out any reasonably sized circular shape, regardless of whether it had a central hole. This could mean blanks intended for formation into bowls or platters. But in particular, I'm thinking of the many bronze mirrors from the period to be found in collections such as those held by the British Museum. Some of which show a very precise perimeter and a simple circular ornamentation pattern on the back remarkably similar to this. Most importantly for this project, the tool's versatility means that it could have easily generated all of the complex circular shapes that are found within the mechanism from the many wheel blanks requiring cutout prior to filing of teeth, to the channel in the front dial and its matching calendar ring. There are several tools indicated within the features of the mechanism for which no physical example remains from the period, most notably the lathe. And I think there's a strong possibility that this might also be one of those tools. In any event, I'll continue to investigate and develop the tool and see where it leads as I move forward with the construction of the mechanism. Thanks for watching, I'll see you later.